Okay, so let's pray before we start. Our gracious Father in heaven, thank you so much for your grace and love for us. You gave your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to save us. And now we have become your child and we'll be joining you in heaven and we'll spend eternity with you. Heaven is the place where there's no tears, no pain, no death. That's the perfect place you prepare for us. So we thank you so much for that. And even in this world, you gave us the church, the body of Christ, so that we can fellowship together and we can work together and we can encourage each other. So today we are here to listen to your word. Please open our heart and give us understanding so that we can find out your will through the scripture. From the beginning to the end, I commit the rest of time unto your mighty hand. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Okay, let's turn to uh, Judges chapter 7. Judges. Chapter 7, verses uh, 2 to 8. Uh, let me just, uh, because some of your microphone is not mute. Okay, let's go. Okay, Judges chapter 7, verse 2 to uh, 8. So let's read um, from verse 2 to 8 together. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, the same shall go with you, and of whomever I say to you, This one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the, the other people go, every man to his place. So the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands, and he sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men. Now the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. I think many of you know this story very well, that Gideon uh, fighting against the Midianites, and God chose these 300 men uh, to fight for him. And originally it was not 300, as you see, it was uh, 32,000 people were there, right? But um, those who are afraid and fearful, they, they went back, so 10,000 remained, and out of 10,000, God again chose uh, 300 men. And from this story, uh, I think uh, there are many lessons uh, we can learn from this story. So, first of all, in verse 2, uh, when God saw these uh, 32,000 Israelites, God said, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Let me tell you, we are Christians and we are in spiritual battle. And in this spiritual battle, it's not like a physical battle 
the worldly battle. So it's totally different. Uh, when there's a war between nations, the number of the soldiers uh, matter. So the more you have, the better, right? Because uh, that means you are stronger. However, God said here, the men who are with you are too many. There are too many. No. So we can see that for God, the number doesn't matter much, actually. Which means that in the church, there are many, many brothers and sisters, and you might say, wow, we are many, and you might be encouraged. But the fact is, God uses very small number of Christians for his work. Uh, there are very faithful Christians who are willing to sacrifice everything for the Lord, and God works through them. And actually, uh, the first thing God said was, those who are fearful and afraid, let them go. So we know that God chooses people who are not afraid. Why? Because God, when God is with us, you know, no one can beat us. And this lesson is really important because as a human being, we are like that. If there are many brothers and sisters, somehow we are encouraged and we think, oh, we are many and then we can do many things for the Lord. We feel like that, right? But uh, as we study this passage, that's, that's not the case. So let's bookmark here because we'll come back here again and again. Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 6. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 6. 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 6. There are many places in the Bible showing that the number of people doesn't matter, actually. So, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 6, let's read it together. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Jonathan, the son of Saul, King Saul, was a man of faith. And one day, you know, he and his armor bearer, only two, he wanted to go to the Philistines and fight, actually, and see what he said. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. By many or by few, it doesn't matter. Sometimes God uses many people, but sometimes God uses very few people. And Jonathan here, he had the confidence that God will use him to defeat these Philistines, right? And also let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 40. Chapter 17, verse 40. First uh, Samuel chapter 17, verse 40. 4 zero. Mm. So let's read it together. Then he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. This is about David and Goliath, as you know, right? The Philistines were so strong, so the army of King Saul, they couldn't even... Um, they couldn't fight against this Goliath, the giant. But David, a young man, he didn't even chew, he didn't have the sword or spear, the proper weapon. He just took five smooth stones and sling. And then, you know the rest of the story, right? Uh, he killed Goliath. And then they won great victory for the Lord. Remember, you might feel that, you know, oh, I'm alone, or we are very few. It doesn't matter. What matters is whether God is with you or not. That's what matters, actually. When one person, only one person, uh, faithful enough to trust God no matter what, then God can use that one person for their great work. Think about Apostle Paul, you know. He turned the whole Roman Empire upside down 
planting many churches, preaching the gospel to so many people. 30 years he worked so hard, risking his life, actually. And so many people got saved through him. And I really hope and pray that one of you might be someone like Apostle Paul or even David, so that you can bring glory and honor to our Lord, even though, you know, you might feel that, oh, I'm nobody. I'm no one. I, I'm not really capable of doing anything great. We feel all like that, and that's, that's good, actually. You know, if you say that, oh, I'm, I'm very, uh, you know, I'm very talented and skilled, if you feel like that, God will never use you. These days, in November, uh, we are appointing the new church officers for the new year. In Swan Church, actually, in December, we start with the new uh, church officers. So uh, we are very busy uh, by talking to brothers, sisters, and appointing the new officers. And one thing is this, those who obey, even though this, uh, the job of church officer is not easy, actually. You have to take care of many brothers, sisters. You have to come to the church very often to, to work very hard uh, because there are so much work in the church. But those who just say, Pastor, uh, thank you for choosing me as a church officer, even though I'm not so much, uh, I'm not so much talented or I'm not so much skilled, if you just let me work for the Lord, I will do that. That, that heart is important, okay? Because God uses such a person. And Gideon was one of them, right? So the number doesn't matter. And let's go back to uh, Judges chapter 7, verse 3. Now, therefore, Judges chapter 7, verse 3, I told you to bookmark uh, Judges chapter 7, uh, verse 3. Now, therefore, proclaim in the, in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. Think about it. You know, long time ago, in the battle, when you go to the battlefield, you might die, actually. You know, they, they fight with a sword and spears and then, or the slings and whatever. And maybe uh, you might have your you know, arms cut off or... Uh, that's, whenever I think about the war in the Bible, it's really terrible, actually. Okay? Um, you might die. So, here, when, um, when God said, whoever is fearful and afraid, let them go, 22,000, they, they went back. And 10,000 remained. Okay? Why are you afraid? Why these people, uh, these 20,000, why they were fearful and afraid? When God, we believe, is the one who created the whole universe, right? We, we say that God is our Father. He, he loves us. He takes care of us. And then He is always with us, right? And Israel, they knew that they were the chosen people of God. God is always with them, fighting for them. Why they are afraid? I believe that's because of the lack of faith. Okay. Why you worry? You know? Why you worry about what to eat, what to wear? Hmm? Because you, know, you don't trust your Father in heaven. That's why. And this is a really great lesson, even for Christians. When you really trust God, you have no fear, actually. Because we Christians are the one who has no fear. Why? We are not afraid of death. When we die, we know where we are going. But the others, unbelievers, they don't know where they are going and they, they will end up in eternal hell. But for us, actually, Apostle Paul, he said, I'd rather be, I'd rather uh, leave this world and I'd rather be present with the Lord. Which means that he says, I want to go to heaven as soon as possible. Actually, because he suffered so much. But for your own benefit, I'm staying here in this world to preach the gospel and to, to teach them how to grow as a Christian. But 
in his heart, he wanted to be with the Lord in heaven as soon as possible, right? Remember, if you really want to be used by God, for example, to preach the gospel, or even in your workplace, maybe you might be persecuted when you are trying to defend your faith. You know, people might mock you and uh, speak evil of you, and you might really suffer. But we Christians has, have no fear. Uh, let's turn to Psalm number 56, verse 4. Psalm number 56. Verse 4, uh, 3 and 4, Psalm number 56, verses three, uh, number, uh, verses 3 and 4. Let's read it together. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what can flesh do to me. Flesh means people. Humans, right? This is the psalm of um, uh, this is the psalm of David. Actually, David, of course, he was on the run because uh, King Saul tried to kill him so many times. But in his heart, he says, "Whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in God. I will trust in God." You know why God blessed uh, America, the United States of America? Because even in their bill, right? In God we trust, they say, right? In verse 4, in God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? Again, in verse 10, in God, I will praise his word. In the Lord, I will praise his word. In uh, verse 11, let's read it together. In God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? That's true, actually. Of course, we suffer. We Christians face hardship and trials. That's true. That's unavoidable because uh, God wants to train us, actually. That part is inevitable. But when we are in the dark valley, we have no fear as long as God is with us. So don't be afraid. You know? As long as you trust God, He will take care of you. Psalm number 118. Verse 6, Psalm number 118, verse 6. Psalm 118, verse 6. Let's read it together. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? You know, um, one pastor was sharing this testimony and which touched my heart, actually. He said, when he got saved uh, as a young Christian, he was afraid whenever he heard the story about the persecution a long time ago. You know, the persecutions, like the Christians burned alive by uh, Emperor Nero and in the Colosseum, the lions, the hungry lions were devouring these Christians and dying. The pastor, he was saying that whenever he heard that story, he was thinking, can I be um, bold enough? You know, if that happens to me, um, can I die without fear? Like that, right? What about, what about you? Have you thought about that? You know, suppose uh, in Korea, suddenly the government says, don't go to the church or you will die. Uh, or you will be put into the prison. And I wonder how many will come to the church on Sundays, actually. But anyway, the pastor was saying that, he was very afraid of that kind of things, uh, but later he realized that God is so gracious. So if you don't have such a strong faith, that will never happen to you, actually. Okay? That uh, dying as a martyr, dying for the Lord, is not for everyone. Okay? It is for those who have the strong faith, actually. So don't worry. You will face... Uh, hardship or trial which you can bear if not god will never uh, put any you know this hardship on you unless you can bear it okay so don't worry and this gideon 
now he is about to fight against the Midianites. And God said, those who are afraid and fearful, let them go home. Because you think the more the better, it's not actually, okay? Those who have no fear, even though they are small, they are better than many who have fear. Think about a boat, big boat. There are a hundred people rowing. If you go one direction, the more the better. But if they row in each direction, you go nowhere actually. So the number, the number of people doesn't matter much. You know? What matters is whether you are really trusting God or not. So again and again, the Bible says we should be um, courageous. Okay, let's turn to Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1. Let's read it together. The wicked flee when no one pursues. But the righteous are bold as a lion. We are lions. No, we should be like a lion. Lion is the king of the animal kingdom, right? So, you know, we are not afraid of death. We are not afraid of people. What can flesh do to me? You know, that should be uh, our heart as Christians, right? The righteous are bold as a lion and we never draw back because God is with us. Psalm number 29, Psalm number 29, verse 25. Psalm number 29, verse 25. Let's read it together. The fear of man brings, uh, Psalm number 29, verse 25. Let's read it together. The fear of man brings a snare. Oh, sorry, Proverbs. Uh, I was looking at Proverbs. And then I say some. Sorry, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25. <laughs> yes, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25. Let's read it together. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. You know snare? To catch an animal, you put snare. So when you are caught in the snare, you cannot move actually. Okay? As, as a Christian, we should fight freely. But if you are caught in a snare, it restricts your freedom. Okay? We should be as bold as a lion. So let me tell you one thing. Abraham, he lied. I mean, half lie. He said that his wife Sarah is his sister. Right? Why? Because he was afraid of people. And in Numbers chapter 14, the 12 spies went through the land of Canaan and when they came back they, they, they gave the bad report and they said that there are giants in the land of Canaan and what happened? The Israelites were afraid and what happened? They spent 40 years in the wilderness because they were afraid, right? Peter why he denied Jesus three times? Because he was afraid of death, right? Let's turn to Galatians, Galatians chapter 2. Later, Peter made one more mistake because again he was afraid of people, right? Um, Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Let me read. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Verse 12, let's read it together. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. This is really interesting. Uh, Peter, who is Peter? the leader among the apostles. And what happened is, even in Acts, you, you know that Peter preached the gospel to Cornelius, the Gentile, and he knew exactly the will of God. 
the gospel should be preached to the Gentiles. And then when they are saved between the Jews and Gentiles, there is no difference. There is no war. We are all God's children. But here, what happened was, some, Jewish, some Jews came from uh, James. The Jews came from James. That time Peter was eating with the Gentiles. And he was afraid of these people, the Jewish people. So he just uh, left. You know, because he didn't want it, want it to be seen by these people from James that he was with the Gentiles. And Apostle Paul rebuked him because this is a serious matter. This is about the gospel message. What is the gospel? We are all sinners, but because of the blood of Jesus Christ, now there's no difference between the Jews and Gentiles. Now we are all God's children. So we can eat together, right? The law, the law which is separated uh, between the Jews and the Gentiles is gone. It has been abolished by the blood of Jesus Christ. Right? We are all one. That's why um, Apostle Paul withstood him to his face. This is a serious matter. Let's think about it. Peter, why he made it the same mistake again? He feared people. Okay? Let's turn to Hebrew chapter 13, verse 6. Hebrew chapter 13. Verse 6. Hebrew chapter 13, verse 6. Let's read it together. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Maybe in your workplace, you are talking with your co workers and uh, some of them might ridicule the Bible, Jesus, the Christians. Oh, these Christians, on Sundays, they cannot enjoy, but they have to go to the church and they have to, you know, uh, gather together, something like that. And as a Christian, you know, if you are afraid of people, then you don't say anything. You don't say anything, but that's not good because, you know, as a Christian, you say that, no, I want to serve my Lord, Jesus. He's my King. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. And you should be also prepared for judgment when you die, actually. When you die, you'll face the judgment. We can say boldly because that's true. Okay? We have to share the stories in the Bible, the truth, you know, who our God is, who is Jesus. But if you fear people, then you cannot, right? Okay, let's go back to Judges chapter 7, verse 4. Judges chapter 7, verse 4. Let's read it together. But the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for, for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you, and of whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. Do you know God tests people? God tests people. God wants to know what is in your heart, actually, what kind of Christian you are. Actually. Because here, God said, I will test them for you there. Still, there are 10,000 people. But God said there are too many. Because if it's too many, later, uh, when they have a victory, they might say, oh, because, you know, we won the victory. We were strong. They, don't, they wouldn't glorify God. So God wanted to have a very few numbers, number of people. And he said, I will, I will test them. Okay? This test shows that, you know, who have the genuine heart for the Lord? Who are ready to serve the Lord? Let me tell you what happened. Judges chapter 8, verse 4. Uh, later, you know that 300 were chosen. And Judges chapter 8, verse 4. Uh, let's read it together. When Gideon came to the Jordan, he and the 300 men who were with him crossed over, exhausted, 
but still in pursuit. I like this one, exhausted. They were tired. You know, they fought the whole day and then still they were in pursuit for the Midianites. They were exhausted, but they still followed Gil, uh, 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 Gideon and they were fighting to the end. Why? These are the ones who were chosen by God. They are the ones who passed the test. Actually. Okay. So let's see what, 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 what was the test. Uh, anyway, let's remember David also was tested after he was anointed. More than 10 years, he was on the run. But he never uh, lost his faith in God. And Joseph, after he saw the dream, the vision in his dream, 13 years he was a slave and prisoner, but he still trusted in God. So those who were used by God, they passed the test. And they were so very uh, faithful. And here in Judges, let's see what kind of test was there. Verse 5, verse 5, uh, Judges chapter 7, verse 5. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. So you can look at me. Okay, this is what happened. So um, Gideon took them to the water, and he saw how they drink from water. One group, these 300 people, they, they put the water in their hand like this, okay? And then they were lapping with their tongue, like a dog laps. But the others, how many are there? Uh, 9,700, right? Because there were 10,000. 9,700, they knelt down and they put the face on the water and then they drank from the water. So what's the difference? Think about it. They are ready to, they are about to fight against the Midianites. And when you fight, you should be very cautious. You know, those who knelt down and drink, drink water, they didn't care what was around them. They just focused on drinking. But those who put the water in the hand and lap, they were watching and they are drinking. They were very cautious, right? So that's why God wanted to choose these 300 who are always, uh, you know, uh, very careful and watching out, right? Even among these um, Christians, there are brothers, sisters who are caring for other brothers, sisters, and they know what's going on in the church. And they are always praying for the church. But those who drink uh, by kneeling down, they just focus on drinking, which means that there are Christians who are so focused on their own work, worldly job or their own work, they don't even know, you know what is going on in the church in this spiritual warfare. Do you know from tomorrow, from tomorrow we'll have the Bible seminar in Swan Church the last Bible seminar this year. I'm very glad this time because now uh, people can come to the church and they can attend the Bible seminar in person. Okay? Because so far, we've been doing this online Bible seminar. right? So let me ask you, are you happy? You should be happy because uh, on, through online, we found that it's very difficult to preach the gospel. But they should come and sit and listen. Okay? So I'm very glad that somehow God allowed us to be together in the church building this time. And this is the last Bible seminar this year. Okay. So uh, some of you, because you don't speak Korean language, I know you cannot attend. However, you can pray, right? You can pray and then some of you as a foreigner, even you are meeting some Koreans in your workplace. You can ask a Korean friend to attend the seminar, even though maybe you don't understand Korean language. Right? And they are the ones who are like awake as Christians. Right? 
those who know what's going on in the church, what to pray for, and what all the brothers and sisters uh, go through. If any brother or sister needs some help, you, know, you can go and help them. Right? So uh, these 300 who are taking water in their hand and lapping like a dog, they're the one who is always watching. Okay? They are ready to fight, actually. They, they passed this test. And they are the one who are in the pursuit till the end, even though they were exhausted. You know, they were with Gideon, uh, and they won great victory. In our time, we need patience and endurance, actually. You know, we heard that Jesus is coming very soon, but it looks like uh, he is being delayed. And then when we keep hearing that Jesus is coming soon, but he doesn't come, we might say, is it really coming like that? And then somehow, like that, ten virgins were there, five with oil, the other five without oil, but they all dozing and slumbering, right? Because that, that's what Jesus said, what will happen in the end time, right? Let's turn to Hebrew chapter 10. Hebrew chapter 10. Verse 36 and 37, Hebrew chapter 10, verses 36 and 37. Let's read it together. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. So this is about us, actually. You know, Christians who are waiting for the Jesus' second coming and verse 36 says, For you have need of endurance and patience, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. You know, we should be working hard until Jesus comes again. This is the last chance. This is really last chance. Whenever we have a Bible seminar, I think that, oh, this might be the last Bible seminar, or this might be the last summer retreat, because that's true. You know that uh, Israel became independent in 1948, which means that it was uh, more than 70 years ago, and the generation who saw the independence of Israel, they will see also Jesus coming again, actually. That's what Jesus said. So we should be waiting for Jesus with endurance and patience because Jesus will be coming very soon. Noah, I think he was uh, very patient. He was preaching the gospel, not the gospel, the warning again and again while he was building the ark. This ark was pretty big, 135 meters long, right, 20, 30 meters wide. 14 meters high. It took a long time, and while he was building this ark, big ship, he was preaching and preaching. People, please come to the ark. It will be raining. When there was no rain, by the way, before Noah's flood, there was no rain in this earth. Okay? So, we should be among these 300 people of Gideon, um, to do that, to be among these 300, we should be patient and we should be enduring. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. Let's read it together. But in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumors, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings. And now you know why God chose only 300 people. Because if you are really ministers of God, you have to go through 
all these things, tribulations, needs, distresses, stripes means you'll be beaten, imprisonment, tumults, labor, sleeplessness, fastings. Only those who pass that test can be faithful workers of God. Okay? And these 300 out of 32,000, they were the one who were fighting against the Midianites. So let's go back to the judges, chapter 7. Let's see how they fought and how they won the victory. There's another lesson we have to learn. Uh, judges, chapter 7, verses 19 to 23. 19 to 23. Let's read it together. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had posted the watch. And they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers, they held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing. And they said, they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And every man stood in his place all around the camp. And the whole army ran and cried out and fled. When the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companions throughout the whole camp. And the army fled to Beth Acacia toward Jerera, as far as the border of Abel Mehola by Tabath. And the men of Israel gathered together from Naphtali, Asher, and all Manasseh and pursued the Midianites. Look at this. This is very interesting. Instead of having the sword or other weapons, they had the trumpet, right? They had the trumpet in their right hand. And they had the torches, torch, you know, torch the light inside the pitchers. So that, you know, it is inside the pitchers, so people couldn't see the light in the beginning, right? So what happened was, at the same time, they broke the pitchers. They broke it in the middle of the night. So what happened? The light, there was a light suddenly. And it's, it's dark, very dark in the night. So the median eyes, when they saw the light, so many lights, right? They thought the Israelites came in so many numbers. They, they had no idea what's going on. And then there was again the trumpet, blowing the trumpet. This is God's word, not people's war. That's why even the weapon they use is from God's wisdom, right? The trumpet, torches, and the pitchers, they broke the pitchers so that the light can shine. What does that mean? There's a great lesson we should learn. This pitcher, this earthen vessel, pitcher, represents our body. And the light, the torch, is the Holy Spirit in us, or our godly life. We Christians, there's a struggle between the flesh and the Holy Spirit all the time. Flesh and the Holy Spirit. And only when we break our flesh, when we surrender to the Holy Spirit, that's when we win the victory, right? Uh, let's bookmark here and let's go to the Second Corinthians chapter four. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse seven. Second uh, Corinthians chapter four, verse seven. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse seven. Let's read it together. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. This earthen vessel, that means our body. And this treasure means eternal life and all the blessing we receive from God. You know, as a Christians, we have a treasure in us. 
when people look at us, we are not so special. We are just uh, ordinary people. But before the eyes of God, we are so special. And we are the one for whom Jesus died. Actually, right? We are God's children. So we have this treasure in this earthen vessel. Earthen vessel, our body. Your body is uh, not so valuable because it's earthen vessels. You are so precious because of your spirit in your body, inside of your body, right? And remember, this earthen vessel should be broken. What does that mean? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Because you do not follow the desire of your own body or your own flesh, but you know, your body should be broken and the desire of your body should not be followed. Let's turn to, turn to Mark chapter 14. There's a story of this uh, woman, Mary, who broke the alabaster um, flask of the oil. Mark chapter four, 14 verse 3. Mark chapter 14, verse 3. Let's read it together. And being in Bethany, at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spike nard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. This is Mary, actually, whose brother was resurrected. Uh, what was his brother's name? Lazarus, right? So Mary came with this very costly oil and she broke the flask to pour this oil on the head of Jesus Christ. Why? She knew. She knew Jesus would die. So she wanted to, she wanted to, you know, uh, remember the death of Jesus Christ uh, that's why, verse 9, she has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Burial. She knew what would happen to Jesus. That's why that 300 denarii worth of oil, very costly. Now, 300 denarii means uh, like a that's the money you will earn for the whole year. When you work the whole year, that's the salary you get. So anyway, she broke the flask. That means sacrifice. Okay. So who God will God use for his ministry? Those who are ready to break the flask. The alabaster flask is also very costly, but for Jesus, you can you can give him anything. Actually, you know. Let me tell you. If you are hold on to this world, you cannot glorify God, because if what you consider is only your body or your family or earthly things then this gospel cannot be preached. You know. Yesterday I was talking to one missionary. Uh, he is now in Korea because his wife became so uh, sick, very serious condition. Okay? And these days, because of coronavirus, they cannot even fly to Korea easily. So he suffered so much. He said last three weeks he was with his wife in the hospital. Uh, taking care of her actually now she is better but I was thinking that you know these missionaries who are working in the remote place very remote there's no good hospital no good school for their children and then uh, another another missionary is visiting Korea because his mother is very sick with cancer and uh, I was talking with him and uh, I told him, yes, this is the, the most difficult part for missionaries. You are so far away when your family members are sick. There's nothing you can do, right? Suppose you are the, like, uh, the opposite side of the earth, like uh, halfway around the globe, like uh, South America. 
So even if you want to come, it will take like 30 hours of flight. It takes so long. It's too far. You cannot visit Korea so often. But your father or mother becomes very sick. Maybe they might die soon. But there's nothing you can do there because you are so far away, right? Because of all these sacrifices and their hard work, that's how the gospel was preached. You know, in our church, there was one missionary who came from Netherlands, Holland. And when he came, I heard that he got a room in a very remote place to learn Korean language. Because without learning Korean language, he cannot preach the gospel. So six months, he practiced Korean language, and he became fluent in Korean language. And from that time on, what happened was, you know, he's a European speaking Korean language. That time, very few Westerners spoke Korean language. So he was invited in this church and that church from that time on, he could preach the gospel freely, actually. So I was thinking, wow. So that's why uh, he was not in the big city. He went to the countryside. He got a small room and he met Koreans every day to practice Korean language, six months. And uh, after Korean War, you have to remember, Korea was very poor, right? The condition was pretty bad. So I believe he had suffered so much at that time, actually. He came from Netherlands, far away from Europe, and then he learned you know, how to speak Korean language. And that's how our church started, because uh, he preached the gospel to one pastor, and that pastor shared gospel with another pastor. That pastor is our most senior pastor, Pastor Johan, actually. That's how our church started. Okay. And then I, I think, you know, I, I think that because of the sacrifice of that, that missionary from Netherlands, okay, that sacrifice bears many fruit, right? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 15. Matthew chapter 5, verse 15. Let's read it together. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all you are in the house. Jesus said in verse 14, You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. But if you put the light under the basket, what is this basket? This basket was used to measure grain at the time. Suppose you go to the grain store, and you want to buy like one kg of rice, they measure it with a basket. This uh, measuring basket is there. So putting the light under a basket means that even though you have the light, you are so into these worldly things. You know, your job, your own family, you want to have a better house, better car. Everything is about yourself and your family. So narrow-minded, you don't care about God's work. That is putting the light under the basket. Because this basket means your own physical life. Okay? Don't do that. Because nobody sees the light. Right? The light should be put on a lampstand so that it can shine. And people can see the light so that they can come to the Lord, come to Jesus Christ. Right? Gideon and 300 men they broke the pitcher. Only then the light inside could shine. Okay? Without breaking the pitcher, no light, basically. And no victory at all. But they broke the light, the, the pitcher, and the torches were shining. And then with the blowing of trumpet, they won a, a great victory. So let's go back to the uh, judges. Chapter 7, verse 15, uh, uh, verse 16, 16, um, Judges chapter 7, verse 16. Let's read it together. Then he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet into every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. 
So one thing we have to remember is God's weapon is different from what we use for war, actually. Okay? It's so different. Do you remember the five stones David used to fight against Goliath? Five stones. Okay? No sword, nor spear. Five stones. And David won a great victory against Goliath. Our world, battle is spiritual battle. That's why it's different from what the world uses as weapons. Let's turn to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. Second Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4. Let's read it together. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. The weapons, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Peter, John, they were fishermen, uneducated men. But when Peter preached, 3,000 got saved. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was with him and God used Peter. That's the reason. No matter how smart you are, no matter how good education you have, it doesn't matter actually. Are you faithful to God? And are you bold like a lion? Right? The first test was, uh, you know, those who are afraid or fearful, let them go home. Which means you should be courageous and bold as lions. Because God uses such people. Right? And secondly, those who always watch and then those who know this time, you know, what kind of time we are living these days. Jesus might come anytime soon. So those who know the times and then always uh, uh, watch the times and uh, go for the chances to preach the gospel, those who are lapping the water, watching around, they are the ones who are used by God. And the weapon they used is not the sword, but the light in the pictures. And the pictures were broken. Our body should be broken to work for the Lord. So this is about the spiritual world, and we have to learn all these lessons from Gideon and these 300 men. They were exhausted, but they were still in pursuit, means that they did their best you know, in their battlefield. Of course, sometimes we are tired, exhausted, but with the power of the Holy Spirit, we continue to serve the Lord until Jesus comes again. Okay? So, listen to uh, Philippians, the last verse. Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. Let's read it together. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, have, and have no confidence in the flesh. Uh, who worship God in the Spirit, in another version, it says, who serve God by His Spirit. So the Holy Spirit helps us, actually. Okay? It's not our own ability. You know, when we serve the Lord, it's not from our own ability or power. It should be by the Spirit. And we have no confidence in the flesh, means that our flesh is not helping in our spiritual warfare. You know, our flesh is uh, saying, do this, do that for me. Many, many things the, uh, the flesh wants. The, it has a desire, but we are not fulfilling the desires of our flesh. We have to break the pictures, the flesh, and then we continue to serve the Lord, just like the Gideon and 300 men. Remember, there are many stories about battle, the war in the Old Testament. Why? Because we Christians are in spiritual warfare, and that's why we have to know how they won the victory in the war long time ago, because they are all our spiritual lessons. For our 
uh, spiritual warfare we are waging uh, these days. Gideon and 300 men, even though they were very small in number, remember, 300 is very small. God doesn't look at the number of people. God looks at their heart, their faithfulness, their truthfulness. And then God uses them. When God uses them, God brought about a great victory for them. And that's what we want to happen in our life too. Okay, let's pray together. Our gracious Father, every day we are in the spiritual battle and we need your help, we need your power. And from the story of Gideon and 300 men, we learned many lessons. Especially, we shouldn't be afraid nor fearful because you are always with us and you are the one who protects us and you are the one who watches over us and you are the one who gives us everything we need in our Christian life. So Lord, help us so that we are not afraid and help us so that we can break the pictures. Uh, we don't follow the desire of our flesh, but we only work for your glory and eternal kingdom of God. And Lord, so many people are perishing these days and we need to preach the gospel as much as possible, not only in Korea, but all over the world. Please use us and give us more and more chance to preach the gospel in coming days. Also, we pray for the Grand Bible Seminar starting tomorrow in Swan Church. So in this last Bible Seminar, please help us to uh, invite as many people as possible so that they can listen and they can be born again, and they have eternal life uh, by understanding your endless love. So thank you so much for this time together. In, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen.